All right, you're asking for it, so here it is. Listen to this. Here we go. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the 130th episode of the Drinking Partners Podcast. Yes, you think it's going to be the Steph Curry episode, but I refuse to call it the Steph Curry episode because I'm from Cleveland and we don't like that guy. So it is the Terrell Davis episode. Why Terrell Davis? Well, he uh, he got a start in Denver, Colorado. Mm-hmm. Colorado is important to this podcast. And he went on to win two championships. And I feel like our guests are definitely winning. Yeah. Definitely. Definitely going to go to the Hall of Fame. Championship caliber. Championship caliber beer. All right. That's the first time we've ever said that on the podcast. Championship, Championship caliber, caliber beer. We're also going for our second chip this year as well. We are trying to get our second chip. Uh Hopefully, I don't blow my knee out like Terrell Davis. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> come back of the year. You go for that SV, that come back of the year. Nah, he, I don't think he got that. I think nah. he just became a broadcaster. <laughs> I think he just took his braces off and became a broadcaster. Anyway, I'm half of your hosting tandem, Ed Bailey. I'm joined, as always, with my co-host, Dave Bracey. Say what up to the people. What's good with you people? Uh, we are Drinking Partners, and if you're looking for us, you can find us on epicastnetwork.com slash partnerspod. You can find us on iTunes, Stitcher, Lipson, and Google Play under Drinking Partners. You can find us on IG, Twitter, and Facebook at Partners Pod. Uh, 130 episodes, man. We've been asking you. We're going to continue to ask you, man. Please, hop on iTunes, rate and review. Uh, that's how we know what we're doing well. That's how we let others know that we're doing well. And that's how we continue to do well. So please, hop on iTunes, rate and review. Yes, uh, you love us. When you see us in public, you tell us you love us. Now just go to the internet, click a button, and tell the world. Yeah, yeah. And always in lieu <laughs> of rates and reviews, we will take shots of cognac. True, true. Shout out James, man. Shout Car guy DJ. Car guy DJ. Car guy got it right this time. Car guy DJ, man. Shout out Car guy DJ, man. We do take henny shots, and uh, you know this is uh, this is sounding real smooth right now. I know y'all listening at home, like, oh my god, that sounds amazing. Oh, we have a whole production team here. This is. <laughs> Yeah, it's lights, cameras, and action in here today. Uh, um, and if you're wondering why it sounds so good, uh, that's Epicast, man. Epicast. Um, they keep it sounding very smooth. And uh, if you're looking to get your podcast to sound better, uh, maybe you want to start your own podcast or need help promoting an event, or uh, maybe you want to advertise your product on an award-winning podcast. Uh, that would be us. That would be us. <laughs> Uh, check out Epicast. Go to epicastnetwork.com slash services. Fill out the form and tell them that the drinking partner sent you, man. Get that hooked up. Give us referral points because we got to make quarterly incentive. <laughs> we don't make incentive if we don't meet our referral goal. So we, let, us, let them know that we sent you. We drink hard for the money. Yeah, yeah. That's what we, well, <laughs> we just drink hard. <laughs> We're drinking parties this is, like this is definitely a tennis match for the love. <laughs> <laughs> we just like to hang out, and you guys have given an, us an excuse to record it, and uh, we have the whole production team here, so I'm excited, man. Yeah, yeah, this is dope. Um, just quickly, you know I mean, uh, you're listening to this, uh, you want to look at our next event coming up? Uh, you can catch us down at Compton Theater. We got uh, Quincy Jones coming in. He's got an HBO special. Check out his HBO special. He'll be down at Compton Theater August 26th. Bring in the funny, and we'll have a few more uh, out of town folks. Uh, it'll be a special event, uh, and if you're looking for tickets, that'll be at comptotheater.ticketleap.com. Yeah, very excited for that. Check out Quincy's uh, HBO special, and I'll get you tickets. Now, we we're here. It seems like we're filming an HBO special here. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if these people are here to record us or to judge us. I don't understand. Like, I've never seen so many judging eyes in the same room while we're just talking and drinking beer. So this is awesome. It's like I'm drinking with my girlfriend and her friends. Like, I'm just sitting drinking, playing 2K. Yeah. <laughs> and they're just in the other room talking stuff about me. So this is going to be awesome. But we are here live at uh, Trogue's Independent Brewery. Um, and this is, this is, let me tell you, this is... The greatest place I've ever been in life. This is been, this is fantastic. Yeah, this has been a smorgasbord. <laughs> this is like a, an amusement park of beer. Yeah, I mean, like, it is like an amusement park. Yeah, of beer. <laughs> you For, go, you go on different flavor rides. Yeah, you know I mean, there's different like sections. You know, they have like, tour guides. Yeah, like they have a tour guide. Like you have to schedule a tour, and then you get a tour guide, and you can get some really cool Crocs. Uh, which is awesome. That just adds to the experience. Um, and on top of that, obviously, great beer. And we are we are lucky enough. 
I don't know, blessed. I don't even know how to describe it. I mean, I was, I was, I was driving in. Like, I don't even understand how my life is like this right now. Like, I'm just going in the middle of Pennsylvania to drink like ridiculously delicious craft beer and like talk to the people who make this. Like, who does that? We're sitting Why? here and we're when? gonna have a conversation with the people who made this. Like, that is. Yeah. I've done something right in life. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I've done something well. Um, but we have Chris and John Trogner in the building. Say what up to the people. How you doing? What up to the people? Dude, see, he gets it. You got to get on board, man. You got to say what up to the people. <laughs> oh, he ain't going to say it. He's like, nah. <laughs> He's like, nah. <laughs> yeah, I ain't had enough beer yet. <laughs> How you guys doing today? Couldn't be better if I was twins. Couldn't be better if I was twins. Is that is that is that like a, like a, and twins? Do twins have the most fun? Are they like next to blondes? Like, I don't know. So they, they they're brothers who work together. So they actually like their siblings. I, I don't know if everybody can. You yeah, know what I mean? yeah. Like, I could take my sister in doses. Right. You know what I mean, exactly. I love her to death. I'm there for her, but you know, yeah, I'm, she's family. But yeah. you know, she gotta go home at the end of this. We can't we can't be getting our paychecks from the same place. <laughs> I can't be clocking in and dealing with family issues yeah. and attitudes. I understand. Right? Yeah, daily. Like, yeah, I don't know. Now, you gentlemen are not twins, I, I, I'm assuming, right? Because you said better if you are twins. Yeah, no, not even close. We're 18 months apart, so. That's fairly close. That's pretty, yeah, that's pretty close. Yeah. I mean, to be so close, it, were you always this close? Or have you always dreamed of working together? Or, like, how did this come to be where you all started the brewery as one? Yeah, I, I'm not sure I'd say always, but I think, yeah, sure, certainly John and I had a pretty close upbringing. Um, different interests, different friends, but still... You know, participated in a lot of things. We we grew up in a family kind of working environment too. Okay. That uh, it's been around us for a very long time, and certainly as we got older, you know, we started to think and talk about things that we we might want to do together in form of a, a form of a business, but nothing that was really that serious until you know, of course, we got you know much beyond our, our college careers. Or- okay, so. Now, from my understanding, the entrepreneurial spirit actually runs in the family. Um, so your father was an entrepreneur or did your father and uncle, you well, had, your, they had their own business? Or? Yeah, absolutely. In a sense, you know, our dad had a business with his, his brother mm-hmm. and uh, also their dad, at, uh, you know, for quite some time. So, you know, that was really part of our upbringing is just kind of watch them kind of build that business slowly. And, uh, you know, I think for, for us, that felt normal. You know, it felt like this is something that we want to continue, not necessarily what they were doing, but just the, the vibe of, of, of having family, you know, being a part of a, a business, which, you know, is interesting at times, too. But I think the, the good part is our business is around beer, which is a lot of fun. You know, yeah. their, their business was a little <laughs> bit different. It was more dealing with, with dirt and, uh, and buildings. So, um, so they're it, jealous of you guys. Like, why didn't we think of this? <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, what are what are some of the things that like that that you've been able to uh, implement uh, business wise? What are some of the lessons that like you know? What I mean, business. I'm sure it's a different, a wildly different business, um, in a wildly different environment um, than what you know your father and your uncle uh, were doing. Um, so, what are some of the things that you've carried over from that to you know this craft beer industry? Well, I think one of the maybe the first things was really if it if if there's something that you're interested in is is go and do it for somebody else first or with somebody else first to try to learn from their mistakes and and uh, and just make sure that's something you want to do for a long time because you you spend an awful lot of time working so you know make sure you enjoy it. Um, I think also like we we kind of grew up in an environment where we love to just to see how things were made. We also like to consume, so we love food. We went to a lot of food factories as kids. We went through potato chip companies, pretzel companies, breweries. We went through a couple large breweries at the time. And there was always, you know, things that we were making at home from scratch or from the local region that I think a lot of that kind of set the tone for really what we're doing today, too. Yeah, so the family would travel around through the mainly the East Coast, but um, it wasn't abnormal for us to just go to a place we hadn't been before and explore and check it out and see what we could find usually around what's being made there, what's regional and what was interesting. Um, like Chris said, it, I mean, it could be a candle factory. It could have been really anything that was being made. Um, a boat, uh, we went to a boat making place once, which was really cool. So I think it was just normal for us. We weren't really thinking of 
anything else other than it was it was kind of like a matter of fact of well of course we're going to start a business together we're not quite sure what it's going to be but it, but yeah that, I don't understand the question because there wasn't really any other option like we didn't mm. we didn't even consider like the other world out there it's just that's the, how we the, yep. the nine to five that ninety nine percent of other people kind of like go into like, I mean that's yeah. I mean that that I mean most folks do just you know they come up and they you know they work and they go home and they go to sleep or whatever like you guys have that. Just adventurous. We do that too. Yeah. Well, well yeah. now you do. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's it's a little it's a little different on top than in. Oh, that's you, what. So one thing I think that's kind of bred into us is, um, we love to do the work that we do, mm-hmm. and uh, and we just do it all the time. So you know, being a family business, you can't really get away from that conversation. So you'll be at Thanksgiving. You'll be talking about beer. You'll be at Christmas. You'll be anywhere your kids' birthday parties, and yeah, we'll be over in the corner party, talking yeah. about beer, you know? <laughs> a lot of, you know, brewers, there's that, uh, the engineering, chemistry side of things, and then there's the culinary side, and you kind of got to marry the two. Um, I guess you guys grew up with that, like, that, uh, that, that, that curiosity, like you said, of, of how things work, going to factories, like, seeing how things are made. Like, that, like, being, like, that being a fun trip for you guys, as opposed, like, if I take my daughter to, like, you know, like a, a, a cracker factory. She's not going to be like, oh, man, crackers. She's like, what the yeah. hell is this? So yeah. we see now how fun it was, but I bet it was kids who were like, what, what the hell are we doing? Why are we going here? <laughs> you know, we also grew up um, building forts in the backyard and you know, exploring a lot from a, you know, a physical surrounding standpoint. But, like, I made rocketry rockets, and we would ro- you yeah. know, rocket rockets into the air, and we'd make remote control airplanes and, like, all sorts of geeky stuff that you're physically building things and then having fun with them. So it's... Yeah, I think that was the, the kind of the most exciting part is then trying to do it yourself. Right. So, I mean, you guys, obviously, you're always exploring, always trying new things. So at what point did you get introduced to craft beer? And then when did you decide, hey, this is what we're going to do together? Well, it wasn't until we were 21. Well, you act like that's old. <laughs> at 21, I don't even, was I even on my own lease? <laughs> you think about starting a new company. Uh, I, you know, I think, I think the beer part of it just really kind of extends from, from the food element. So, of course, we had been to a, a, a couple larger, at that time, regional breweries, and I think that was, that was, you know, maybe sparking some of the interest. But it really wasn't until I moved out to Colorado uh, for, for school, and uh, one of the first places I went to was Coors, which is the largest, you know, brewing facility in the world. And then in the afternoon, I went and had dinner at probably one of the smallest brewing facilities in the world, a brew pub. Okay. And to me, that was really kind of interesting to see kind of both the both extremes. And, you know, of course, the smaller one was being a lot more creative with ingredients and, sty- and trying to revive a lot of styles that some of these larger, you know, national or regional breweries were no longer making. So I think that was kind of a big eye-opener to, to me. And, of course, I was talking to John quite a bit about um, the brew pub. I didn't have any beer at the brew pub that day, but... You know, and then uh, down the road was a local homebrew shop, and then it, and and that's when we really started to see like th- this is something that, you know, you can do for yourself. You can kind of learn from brewing, at home, and and through that process, then you know that kind of led us to maybe thinking, this could be a business. So Chris, you started home brewing before John, or like because that makes you a really cool brother to like bring that to John. Like, hey man, we could just make our own beer. And then we could make money making our own beer. He, like, he started making his own beer because he couldn't buy it at that time. That, that is genius. <laughs> <laughs> well, who's the older brother? Because you're supposed to buy the beer for him, my understanding. Like, yeah, I was in Philadelphia at the time. So. Oh, okay. Well, you don't want to ship it. <laughs> I, don't, I think we actually we kind of both started about the same time. Okay. We, we were having a lot of conversations back and forth about uh, homebrewing books that we were reading. Okay. Um, and I, you know, I think it was from... My side, I had more access to it just because of where I lived, right. and, and it was the, the, the brewing scene was really starting to grow pretty rapidly. So I had more resources, I think, than John did. This uh, is like mid 90s? This would have been early 90s. Ni- early 90s? Uh, mid 90s, you're right. Yep. What was the scene like in Philadelphia at that point? So in Philly, uh, well, so I, I had an internship while going to school, and I worked on the 19th floor of a building in, you know, suit and tie, cubicle, and and it just, it didn't click. It wasn't for me. I mean, great people, great place to work. But, you know, every day I, I just couldn't wait to get out of there, you know, to be confined in that space wearing a suit and tie 
Like weddings and funerals, I might wear a suit and tie now, but like, oh. there's no way. I, I, you know, I, I had to tell people all the time, like, I've, everything that I do is to get further and further away from having to wear a suit and tie. Like, I mean, yeah. if I can go anywhere without a suit and tie, I guess that's a dream. I feel like, like, so, so for my first aha beer moment was got off of work, went to the first floor of that building. I don't think I even realized that this brewery was there, but on the first floor, floor of that building was Dock Street Brewing Company. So walked into this brewery, which to me was just a restaurant, sat down and had my first beer that wasn't yellow fizzy, you know, mass produced beer. Didn't know what it was, didn't understand what it was, tasted it and I'm like, whoa, what the hell is this? It's a different color, it's a different texture, and, but I didn't really understand what it was. Um, but that was my first like kind of check mark in the right box. And then, you know, every day I'd go back down and they had so many different beers and just try something new and didn't know what a hop was, didn't know what barley was, but it didn't really matter. It was this like new, fun experience. They also had awesome food. So, you know, still in college, couldn't really afford to dive in too deep, but, uh, <laughs> but try, you know, started the payday, to. The, yeah, the, the payday treat. Like. Yeah. Right, exactly. Yeah, you exactly. Catch your <laughs> yeah, you know I mean? like, cash your check, it's like, I'm going to get this one good one. You know what I mean? Like, That's what college is. Ramen it's noodles for the next two it's weeks. A suit and tie with no money for lunch. That's college. <laughs> That's what an internship is. Pay your interns, people. Don't have your, they got to buy clothes to come to this internship. Now they can't eat. Uh, or at least give a free meal, man. That's that would Awesome. Yeah, that would be super dope. I will work for food. You know what I mean? Yeah, well, you a little, you can't just be working for food now, Dave. Well, I mean, too old not that. now. <laughs> uh, I'm just back then. I wish I had somebody would have gave me, I mean, a free pack of ramen or something. I, I went to hard, school man. for food. Like, I learned that you can finance the meal plan. I got to eat. Mm. Yeah, that's how I started giving blood. I was like, oh, you got free pizza? Here's my court. You want two of these? Like, that's how if I get, give more blood, do I get more pizza? Like that. That's how they get everybody to come to events in college. Yeah. Like, free Chipotle or something. Like, nobody really wants to be in these organizations. They just have free food. That's just how it happens. So you guys do, uh, I guess, a, a regular event uh, for cystic fibrosis. Um, and, um, you know, which is, which is great for the community. Um, I, cause I get this, I get this family vibe as we, get, we came in, did the tour. Um, apparently you guys give out, you know, a little bit of brew, f you know, with the paychecks and whatnot. And like the employees like love this place. Like, I mean, like we were talking to the tour guide and like, she, like she like was glowing talking about, like, I mean, like she felt like she was invested like in this as opposed to just, you know what, I'm here until three and I got to be out. You right. know what I mean? Like you it was, feel that. yeah. I mean, you, you could tell the difference or whatever. And just walking through and talking to everybody, like everybody that I've spoken to has been like, you know, like they, they feel invested in this and you know, with Hershey being, uh, you know what it is, you have Hershey, the, the chocolate factory and whatnot. And, and you know, this whole town, um, and it being family, you know, run like how, uh, how important is that, is that environment to the business? And, you know, what are some other things that you do for the community, um, you know, with the, with the brewery? Well, we definitely think it makes sense to, to, to try to give back to the communities where, you know, not only we live, but, you know, customers and also coworkers. The, the Beer Fest in particular was pretty interesting because that really kind of served two purposes. You know, it was a way to, to help raise money for, for good charity, but also to kind of create more beer awareness for central Pennsylvania. You know, we, we kind of co-started that festival a little over 10 years ago, really with kind of that, that idea of, of uh, drawing more attention to craft beer. And then, you know, as it became successful, our goal was always to kind of wean off and, and let the cystic fibrosis kind of run that on their own. Um, other ways that, you know, we try to give back, we have a, uh, um, a local conser conservancy here where we do a tree planting every year. Um, where a lot of co-workers are engaged in that. There's a, um, uh, a charitable bike organization out of Lancaster. We also try to co-sponsor some rides with them. I mean, it's really, we, we you know, want to be as creative as we can. We try to support, we have a local hop farmer that's not too far from here that's just starting to get up and, and going. So trying to buy as many hops from him and have people involved in, uh, you know, learning about the hop growing process is, is all, you know, just a few things we do. That's weird that you say, like, I mean, he's, like, new, because I think, like, as I drive, you know, further from the city, I get out here. There's a lot of farms yeah, out here. Yeah, I mean, so I just, just, yeah, there's a lot of grass. <laughs> I, I, there was definitely a, a smell of manure every, like, you know, 10 miles. Every exit. Yeah. <laughs> you, get a, you, you smell a different animal's butt yeah. every exit. <laughs> I was trying to, fit, like, <laughs> guess the animal by the, like, you know, Yeah. <laughs> I thought it was only, but, like, you know, so, like, to say that, you know, like, hops was, like, you know, kind of new. Like, what is it like, like, w like starting one? 
one, you guys started when craft beer wasn't really like popping in this region, you know, back in, I guess, with like the mid 90s is when you, you guys started here or whatever. Like, what was it like? You know, because it wasn't like you started in Pittsburgh or like a, a, a pretty dense like region or whatever. Like you're in, in the middle of Pennsylvania. Like, what's it like starting a brewery in the middle of Pennsylvania when craft beer isn't even like, you know, the thing that it is now? So, so one of the great things we had actually in our backyard was Yingling. So we had this, the community had a huge sense of pride for this brewery that's been around forever. Um, How which, far is Pottsville from here? I didn't even... It's like 45 minutes. Oh, okay. Great neighbors, good I don't know friends. where I am in Pennsylvania. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just for the record, I'm just, I, I'm just on a Google map somewhere. You're between <laughs> Pittsburgh and Philly. I'm yeah. between <laughs> Pittsburgh and the Atlantic Ocean. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> all right. Uh, so from a beer standpoint, there was already, already that, you know, I love my backyard brewery mindset. Mm-hmm. So all we had to do which was very difficult, I will say, was to kind of grab in or walk into that and be a part of that. Um, the most challenging part actually was to physically make it, I will say, first, because the two of us would, we were the only ones at the brewery. So right. we had to brew it, filter it, bottle it, keg it um, with some friends and family to help. And then at night, Chris would go out and try to sell it. So How big was your system at that point? Yeah, I, I, I'll have to step in and kind of <laughs> disagree with that. Being Making it is the hardest part. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, you know, it, I've always thought you can make the best beer, best beer in the world, but if you if you don't have the right channels and make the right contacts and have the right support, like it's not going to go anywhere. That's just, it was the same thing we say with yeah, the art. We, you could be the best artist on the planet, but if nobody knows you, it doesn't matter. Yeah, I mean that 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 goes back to the conversation we were having before the podcast, where you two have a synergy, and Day and myself, we 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 like to say that we do where. One person is focused more on, all right, you, you focus on the product a little more, but you have this other individual who is more sales-oriented. Not to say that you can't do one or the other, but one is more focused on this, one's more fo- focused on that as a team. Um, now, being family, family-oriented, family one, how how difficult was it to, to find these roles where these, like, did you two, like, all right, this is what you do best, so, you know, this is what you'll do or was it a natural thing? Cause it kind of naturally for day and myself, it kind of naturally happened where yeah. it was like, all right, you know, the marketing aspect day handles that to a large degree. And then as far as the, the flow of the podcast, the flow of the interview, I'll handle that a lot. Like, how did you say, all right, I'm, we're going to make these beer and then you got to roll this keg down the street. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I guess if you step back to origin story, uh, Chris being out in Colorado, uh, tried to get a job at a brewery and, and couldn't. And the next day, I walked in and got that same job. So, <laughs> oh, so how long did you hold that over his head? Like, you still can't let he still won't let you live that down, so, huh, Chris? To, to, to this day, clearly. <laughs> oh, this is your third barrel. This is my fourth. All right, I've been doing this a little bit longer. <laughs> it wasn't quite that strong, but but really, that is kind of how it went down. You know, I was out of school, and he was still in college, so mm-hmm. they didn't want to hire a college kid. They wanted to hire or a someone still in school they wanted someone out of school so i could be full-time i could and that's where it kind of started at the same time he then went down to a restaurant and uh well a little bit after and got a job at a restaurant so originally the idea was to start a brew pub so we were going to do beer and food and uh you know great advice from our dad really was you better get a job at a brewery first and figure out you know we read some books and we're like yeah we can do this let's just go open a brewery and he's like wait 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 that's awesome. That's great. You know, he wouldn't say awesome, but that's great. Uh, we're behind you. We don't. We think you're crazy, but um, go get a job at a brewery first, and that's you know basically day one. And then from there, it just kind of snowballed. Yeah, we didn't really have a whole lot of discussions about who was going to do what type of thing once we opened. I mean, we did kind of have an idea that my role would be more sales, John's would be more brewing and production. And then once we really like started getting into it, it was more survival mode. And here's what's going to have to happen. (laughs) That's important. Yeah. So I went to a couple different brewing schools. Chris went to brewing school in England. So we both had a beer background, both total beer geeks, both totally into the process of how you physically make the beer. Mm -hmm. Um, So very, very good at that. He's a much better salesman. So he's way better out telling the story. Um, I always say I do the easy stuff. I do the, the brewing and the engineering side. And he takes all the hard stuff, sales, marketing, distribution, HR, books, all the other stuff that 
I prefer not to be on my plate. Yeah, no, I, I feel you. <laughs> so when you, you guys started out, you're in the middle of nowhere, uh, Pottsville's right down the street. Uh, did you, like, start out with, like, you know, more tame beers to kind of, like, you know, ease people into it before you started getting, like, you know, wild, like, with this with this bevy of beers that we got on the table now? I mean, I think that's kind of an interesting point because we did kind of have more restraint in the first year, really three years that we were brewing. And things weren't really gaining traction. Like we, you know, we were okay. We were selling beer. We, we had gotten some really good accounts locally to help us. We were starting to develop a customer base, but things weren't really, you know, getting us to the next level until we kind of ripped those band-aids off and started to do what we really thought was interesting. And that was explore with different ingredients, come up with uh, different beer names and trying to give each beer its own identity and really kind of reverting back to what our original plan was from a beer making standpoint we just didn't open that way troganator was a beer that we wanted to brew before we had we we had opened trogues and it just took us three four years to kind of get comfortable enough to to want to bring that out to market well that's the same thing with like our stand-up set you we don't hit them with our closers you know i mean like we got to ease them into we got to get them to like us to trust us and then you know about 10 minutes into it now we get to you know kind of be more of ourselves and then now you know because they have that built up trust and i guess you guys had a enough of a customer base where like you felt comfortable maybe going you know i mean like experimenting a bit more yeah it was more like we're we're working our you know fingers to the bone and we were finally like if this is going to work we got to change something now Mm. and kind of the saying is like if we're going to go down let's have some fun doing it Uh, right so, so you, we did. <laughs> so you two were more. You're the when we got the tour, they used the term "hop forward." Um, in your introduction to craft, or when you began to fall in love with craft, were you more were you more into hops? And then you're like, all right, like what at what, what what was the decision to be like? All right, we're gonna do this now. We're gonna we're gonna move from this and move here because this is going to, you know, lead to re- the results that we'd like. I think from a beer standpoint, even in the beginning, we were trying to hit different sides of our palate Mm -hmm. so you start with a pale ale that was a very balanced pale ale we had an esb which is a little maltier a little more bitter and then a nut brown so three beers that were you know fairly distinct and different um and then we hit them up with a bavarian lager so it was like a classic bavarian style lager which was basically in the same genre as yingling lager so here we are in the backyard of yingling trying to sell a lager that is on tap everywhere which doesn't you really like, work do you have like hooded men show up at your door like bruh no <laughs> <laughs> heard you had some bavarian out here like, <laughs> our fingers ain't in that pot <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how. That, yeah, I mean, this is the back early now. This is mid now. This is the Clinton era, man. Like it was, it was hood back then. It's a new, it's a new and, market. You know yeah, what I mean? mean, like this is the this is the dirty ups. Like you know, I know how how you in the barrel room, man. Every time I've seen barrels on TV, growing up as a kid, there was a mobster involved. Like that was it was prohibition. You know what I mean? Like so, I know the history of alcohol. I don't know how that was getting down in the nineties. <laughs> yeah, I see more civilized now. But this is twenty years ago. Yeah, we were we were so small that no one had a, any idea we even existed. <laughs> um, so, like, what was the first like wow? Like, like you were like, this is it. Like, people love us now. Like, what was that? What was that point where like you knew you guys were one? Because you said like the first three years or so, you guys were just like, man, you know what I mean? Like, just kind of getting by and like you know doing it for the love and whatnot. And yeah. then you you kind of went wild with it. What was it? What was that point where you were like? This is it. This is this is gonna be something. I don't. I'm not sure if I have that point yet, but um, <laughs> I, I do remember very distinctly sitting at Coakley's Tavern. I think you were with me, and we were we were just drenched in sweat from a, a brutally hard day, drinking an ESB that no one else would would normally order because no one would drink extra special bitter at the time. Had beer in the name. At the end of the bar, I hear a guy say, "Hey, I'll have my regular," and he throws down a Trogues, and we we're like. Holy shit! Someone ordered the beer that we didn't know. Like we always felt like we knew every single person that drank the beer. Like we we almost strong armed everyone into drinking wow. it. So to hear someone else actually order it, it just clicked. We're like, ah, maybe, maybe we can pull this off. Uh, it wasn't until years later that we actually kind of did. But like that was the first thing that I heard. Like, oh wow. Yeah, those small moments of recognition they they are vital. Like it's just something to keep you going. Yeah. Like because you all like in the beginning you do kind of feel like you're running in place. Um, 
And when you get that little little piece of recognition, it could be like for us, it could be someone at a bar saying, hey, didn't I see you at somewhere? And it's like, yes, you did. For that us, is what I do. For us, it was <laughs> when we got uh, Henny shots in lieu of, of a yeah, review. Was, it was like was, people yeah, was were giving like us free shots of Henny, so we might be doing something we want to keep doing. Uh, <laughs> so the, uh, uh, you know, you guys are, you guys are trogues now, and the the market is crazy. I mean, it's like, it, and everybody's talking about the bubble. How do you how do you stay relevant? How like with so many different brewers, so many, you know, because like you guys have the small batch, which I think is amazing that you're at this size, but you still have like this playground of, of beers that you can come out, you know, and 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 experiment with. But like, how do you stay at the forefront? How do you continue to grow in a market where like you know you have so many brewers popping up and they have so many niches that can like experiment with that or or this and and you know come out like how do you guys stay you know relevant and growing in this market and that's something that we ask ourselves almost every day too but you know it it really the fundamental fundamental basics are still still the same you know when we first opened up it was a challenge there were not as many breweries but there were still you know a lot of breweries and and pennsylvania which one of the reasons we love pennsylvania was because you had you know a lot of local pride with not only yingling but also latrobe so you know a lot of places already felt like they had a local beer. So that was always a challenge, you know, in, in the early days. And, and, you know, over the course of the 20 years, we've always been bobbing and weaving and uh, not only trying different things, but tr- just, you know, tweaking our business as as we've kind of grown and, and the basics of trying to brew great beer and, and, and have a, a good local audience and, you know, and have coworkers there to helping us is a big part of what we do today. So... What, what do you think was most instrumental in building the local audience? Um, your investment in the community, in family, or, or the beer itself? Well, I think a lot of it is not only from people that buy beer, but also restaurants. They just want to know where things come from and, you know, what, what makes it tick. You know, can I go see the brewery? What ingredients are you using? You know, do I, do I feel good about what I'm putting on tap? And I think that comfort level in the early days, it just took a long time to visit every beer or every bar, and drink beer at every bar. I can only be so many places so many times. Y'all were getting secret shopped? Yeah. Do what? You were getting secret shopped secret by, local, local, by <laughs> local bars? They just come in and add, just see what the beer was like? Or? Oh, no. we would. We, I would go and visit each one and try oh, to sample as many people as possible. <laughs> he was like Will Smith in, uh, in, in a Pursuit of Happiness. He's from around with a suitcase. <laughs> with a suitcase full of beer. <laughs> Bulging at the size, <laughs> <laughs> but I think I think the difference today is there's there's a lot of really great breweries out there, and there's more and more that keep opening up every day, and and sometimes you feel like they get a pass just because they're new, they get on tap. Where you know when we opened up, getting on tap was the hardest thing in the world. Mm. It take me you know three, four, five visits just to get them to believe I was over twenty one. <laughs> <laughs> So how do you maintain quality with such, you know, like large production? I know that's a thing that a lot of brewers um, face. And I mean, as a beer drinker, like I've tasted the difference in quality going from, you know, like maybe micro to, you know, a larger, you know, I mean, especially when you start to ship out of state and you, you, have, you, you bump up. How do you keep the quality, you know, um, in the brew? I don't know if that's a size related thing. It's more of a mindset related thing. You know, I will say as we grew, we've learned a lot. I mean, 20 years into it, we've made a lot of mistakes. So we know hopefully how to avoid those mistakes. And at the same time, our engineering's gotten a lot better. I understand how the the physical flow of ingredients is a lot better. And I also have a team around me that helps me, you know, build it and design it and uh, implement it so much better than day one. Uh, And that's where the quality comes in. So we can have a taster panel where anyone that works in the brewery, if they have the right taste buds, their taste buds can be trained to pick out off flavors and beer. And they can go to the taster panel twice a day and taste the beers and fermentation and help us determine if the beer's ready and have the right quality. We can have, well, we have full, four full-time people in the lab. So we have lab coverage almost 24 seven, just testing the beer constantly at every step of the way. From yeah. I heard that you had a lab. I was like, they got a, they got a whole lab. Like, yeah. Well, I'm just trying to figure out how do I get on a taster panel? What do I <laughs> like, what do I need to put on my resume? You have to pass a test. <laughs> okay. And then you have to be trained to pass another test. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I'm malleable, so I could be trained. Like, I'm good with that. Yeah. Just get me on the, like, I could do that for a living. I could taste. It's, it's really taste. interesting. Like, with taster panel, either you have it genetically or you don't. Like, you can kind of learn how to sharpen it. But if, you're, if your tongue isn't, doesn't already have the right receptors, you can taste some of it, but you might not be a, a you know, 
really great at it too. Yeah. But it doesn't mean if you're a brewer, you're an awesome taster. It can be anyone in the brewery, any age. Um, it's just more of a genetic thing, actually. Yeah, I was. I mean, we were talking in, uh, you know, on tour. They were saying how, like, you know, folks come in in one position, at, you know, just kind of like entry level, and then they become brewers at some point, you know, uh, which is insane. I didn't even know that was a thing that could happen. Like, you could just come in and be like, I'm folding T-shirts, and then like years later, like now I'm brewing this beer. Like, um, how does that help you guys out in that process? Why did you take that approach as opposed to just hiring, you know, outside brewers or you know. We, we like finding people with the right, you know, personality. You know, they, they fit personality. They're smart. They're compassionate. They make good decisions, calm under pressure. Um, and then if you're, depending on what your strengths are, you can follow different paths through the brewery. Um, if you really want to be a brewer, there's certain things you have to have the ability to do. You have to be able to multitask. You have to have logical thinking. You can't panic under stress. Um, you have to, you know, be able to smell and understand ingredients. Um, but we really pride ourselves on finding people that, um, just have those right traits that we can then foster and help grow um, th- all through the brewery. You know, it could be, could be all over the place. And you don't have to stay in one department. You can jump back and forth and find the right spot. Yeah, you troganize them. <laughs> yeah, no, it, make, it makes a lot of sense. Like, one thing that, like, we discussed when we were doing the tour, like, it makes a lot of sense um, with, with this type of company where if you're of the community, if you're a local if you're a local company, like to have people of the community build that brand and then become champions of the brand. Like not only do they just work here, like they said, they're not just looking to clock out. They become champions of the brand. Oh man, your tour guy was amazing, man. She was, she had me looking yeah. for an application. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to lose her to the White House. She's going to start giving tours of the White House. Man. <laughs> we, we have a lot of great transplants as well. So we, we have some people that have been in other industries and then, want to make a life change so they'll leave you know whatever that may be and then they'll come work at the brewery and all sorts of different areas so how do you feel about like with so growing up um obviously you two had you know you had your father who had the entrepreneurial background but like for myself i grew up in cleveland it's a blue collar town and you're taught pretty much to go get the job at the company that's going to fund your pension and you are now in a position where you empower people like you even transplants you empower people from the community but you empower transplants to come work with you know a, a company and then empower themselves you know how how do you feel about like how how good it, how fulfilling is that that has to feel great like that feels awesome i mean to sit around and you know day one it was two of us and now it's two what 20 it's about 220 so that's pretty cool yeesh yeah, two twenty, and, and nobody wants to quit. Like, <laughs> you can have two twenty, but if one ninety eight want to quit, yeah. like, <laughs> like every, everybody's yeah. excited. Uh, I think I'm excited. I think we're gonna get into the beer now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's get into some of these. Well, we'll I don't know what y'all got down there, but I got all these that I got to deal with. Well, uh, let's start. I guess start from down there, and then we'll work away. Well, no, you got way. your own stuff, brother. Well, no, like, we got an old dude who's no. this, and bro, they sat it down here. I've been with me waiting. For, I've reason. been waiting for this troganators over right, here. I, I need. Now. I need parts. Buzzy, should I share? Buzzy said no. Buzzy said no. All right, we're going to go with the Troganator. Wait, what is this? This is Troganator. Is that Troganator? Yeah. yeah. Is that the bourbon Troganator? No. This is the okay, regular, the and then we're going to go bourbon. Uh, so we're going to get a description of this beer. We're going to do a tasting. Cheers. Obviously, this is, uh, this is how I was introduced to Trog, because one of our first few podcasts, yeah. uh, we, day, not we, Cause I knew I always knew it was called Trogs. They called it Trogs, and it was definitely it was like Trogs. This is Troganator. He got real mad, and I've only seen him mad <laughs> once in the three years we've been doing this. He got real pissed. It's Trogs, and like he shut the whole machine off. He stopped recording. He kicked us out of the studio. <laughs> Try again next week. <laughs> Come back better. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but yeah, no, this is my, like, you know, I go, I grab a 12 pack and, you know, and, and, and it's nice cause it's, it's, it's light enough that like, you know, it, uh, it's enjoyable for, you know, a lot of people, but it's also like strong enough and like have enough flavor that like I, I can enjoy it as well. You know what I mean, like, um, and the people that don't enjoy it, then, you know, I'm just like, well, you know, it's a 12 pack. So, so for the listeners who may not be um, familiar, what, what style is the Troganator and how did it come to be? Is this one of the first beers that you brewed together or? It- it definitely has been one of the one of the earlier beers that we've 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 made, and I think it has a pretty good story. And I think I think you nailed it too. It's 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 very deceivingly smooth. Mm. I mean, the, the double box style is big. It's eight percent, and you may not notice that if it's well made until you, you've had one or two, and then try to stand up. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. it you know there's a lot of malt. That's where the color comes from. There's a nice 
kind of breadiness, a little sweetness from the barley. It's a low hop character, lager yeast, so it's a longer fermentation time. It's aged for a while to, to, to make the beer very delicate and smooth for its strength. Um, we wanted to brew this beer, I guess, before we opened. We had the idea of a double bock. Didn't do it for three, three or four years until I took a, a real fun trip to Germany. And uh, the whole premise of the trip with a friend of mine was just to go to different regions of Germany and just drink beer and then camp. We camped the whole time. So we went to Köln, Dusseldorf, Southern Bavaria, and just sampling the, the, you know, the beers they've been doing for 100 plus years. Mm. And one of my, my most fondest uh, uh, beer drinking memories was at a monastery in Southern Bavaria that was on the top of a hill, and we were drinking liters of Double Bock. Mm, they're monks, man. They be getting it. Yeah. Yeah. And I remember just coming back to when we came back home. I told John we got to brew a double block. Yeah, no, it's, it's you know, it's again, it's my fave. Um, just it, it's so easy, uh, and you know the caramelliness of it. I mean, when the I, we had, yeah, we had some of those, uh, <laughs> some of those out there. They, you guys know the tour. You give us a little bit of the crunch on that. You can actually, you guys ever think about selling those? The the uh, the barley or what is it? Bags that? like sunflower <laughs> seeds, man. People can just take a handful, shake them up, and just oh, eat the them. Malts, yeah, like the yeah. You know, they have the what is it, the caramel malts, and then the chocolate malts. Is this the caramel malt? You want to get your roughage? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> yeah. I'm just saying it's easier to explain the the benefits health wise of a malt than me drinking the beer. I'm like I explain that to my to my woman. Like, hey, listen, I'm eating healthy over here. Yeah, True. it's like liquid bread at that point. It's like liquid it could bread. It sustain you without food for a long time. See, definitely. You've, 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 you've done this. You've explained yeah, this exactly. to your wife before. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no. I, was, yeah, I think everybody in this, because we are like kind of, I don't know, like the stepchildren of the beer industry. Like we don't, we're not in it. I mean, we're not born of it, but like we're, we're around it enough that we drink quite a bit. And like, yeah, I mean, our diet, I think every, does, does your wife always say like, have you eaten today? Is that a thing that she has? <laughs> No, no, no. <laughs> not not even when y'all get home from work. Like if you're if you in if you're in your playground and you're working on a new recipe, mm. you obviously got to t- you know taste test or whatever. They don't, you don't come home and they're like, all right, uh, so it's I, a testing day. Uh, I mean, we have a playground of beer, but you also have a playground of food. Yeah, yeah, so. you got the <laughs> yeah. food right next to it. Yeah, we yeah. don't ha- always have that. We're typically just around the beers portion of it. Yeah. The food is like, uh, I'll just wait till I get home. So yeah. No <laughs> testing days on the calendar on the refrigerator at home. No, I, I'd never skip a meal. <laughs> Oh, she listens to the podcast. You, okay, his wife is listening to the podcast. No, actually, if you, if you ever listening to the podcast. wink, wink. If you ever travel with Chris, you make sure, have to make sure he gets fed on a regular basis. Yeah, you know, you you you're not yourself. You get a little Snickers. You got the Snickers in the in in the, in the glove compartment. Oh yeah, it's at least at least three to five, not full meals, but just I, I like to constantly eat. <laughs> I like the three to five small meals thing. I mean, that's probably why you're so thin because you got the, you know, the metabolism mm-hmm. and all that is going and whatnot. Hyperactive, yeah. Yeah, you know, and oh, I mean, I shit to keep, to, for you to be that thin with all this beer going around, that's a, that's, that's a workout. I, I strive to do that at some point. It's not going to happen. You're thin as hell, and we drink beer for a living too. Like, yeah, I know. <laughs> We're a beer podcast. But I don't we know weigh like I'm, 112 pounds. I don't know if I'm going to make past 40, though. Yeah, yeah I mean, it's well, easy to do yeah. that. Yeah, me, yeah, shit. Bad. I'm 40. Yeah. I mean, I'm, like I said, I might, I might die young, you know, skinny and, and, and pretty like Michael Jackson. Who knows? All right. So two out of three ain't bad, as they say in the song. Uh, Troganator, deceivingly smooth. You actually got to keep it. You should make a T-shirt and put it in the merch uh, room. The deceivingly smooth. Deceivingly smooth. That's oh, is this, the, is this the bourbon? This is the bourbon. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Oh, oh, yeah. You know. Oh, yeah. So just you guys are uh, new on the podcast. Once Day starts mumbling, he's actually had enough beer. So. He just start mumbling, so he's he's a uh, no. He's I, a, I love bourbon <laughs> barrel everything, and like because of you know it's expensive, and you know what I mean like, and I this is one of my favorite beers <laughs> on a bourbon barrel, so this is I'm excited for this. That is the blackest thing you've ever said. <laughs> I love bourbon because it's expensive. Thank you, Dad. Thank you. <laughs> the cat's out the bag. <laughs> the cat is out of the bag. <laughs> Mm. So, so, if you take Troganator <laughs> with that uh, deep, rich, malty backbone, get some really fresh, you know, uh, recently emptied bourbon barrels, oh, yeah. and put the beer inside and let it sit for four to six months, usually, sometimes a little longer, depends on the wood, depends on the atmosphere, it has to breathe, so it has to let, you know, the flavors out of the wood and into the, the beer itself, so we want to get that toasted coconut, that vanilla, that caramel, uh, without it getting into a cardboardy flavor, so it's really kind of it. You know, 
having that that interaction with the wood and the the bourbon actually raises the alcohol a little bit increases the the heat of the alcohol which helps thin it which is really nice because otherwise it's going to be viscous and like really thick over your tongue so it's really balanced between the, those those three things the heat of the alcohol the caramel malt or the munich malt turning into that caramely flavor and the villain, vanilla and the toast of coconut from from that bourbon where do you get your barrels from wherever we can get the best freshest barrels at that time mm. Is that like the industry standard just to get wherever you can get them from, just get them from wherever? Or is it, do people generally have like a supplier? A supplier like, yeah, of you have a source. Every yeah. time yeah. We, you got a guy. I got a guy. Yeah, <laughs> every time we've asked, like, yo, whoever got them. Like, yeah, like, it's, it, 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 like everything, every time we've interviewed, some, every aspect, hops and like yeah. little different, it's just like, I got a guy. And like, everybody was like, you know. Never want to say his, yeah, say they, his yeah. name. For, for a while. Nobody want to talk about the Can't connect. talk to him on the phone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta send a carrier pigeon. <laughs> you probably go call you tonight. Like you ain't say my name on that podcast, right? <laughs> <laughs> how do you? How does that guy sell that first barrel? Like, do we just show up and yo know, come to the van right fast? You got a you got a U haul van with barrels you, in there? Yeah. Do you like? Yeah. I mean, wipe your finger in and take a lick. Like, oh, that's fresh. That's that, that's that pure. That's uncut. <laughs> he got a <laughs> piece of barrel and some a, and some saran wrap to show up with a piece of barrel. Like, chew on this. <laughs> it's that uncut barrel. Because like you like so you bought barrels, yeah. Because there's there's first. There's like first usage barrels, and then you can like you know, and then there's second, and and I'd like from my understanding, there are brewers that'll take like they're cheaper after they've been used maybe once because it's been leased a little bit, and then they'll use like second age, and then even third, and then sometimes people just pour, you know, like liquor into it. I mean, again, these I've, we've known a lot. So like, wait, there's a resale market. So after yeah, there's a resale barrel, after you use it to brew a beer, you can then sell it again. Yeah, I mean, because it's not Man, as apparently like it's not as potent as that barrels. like. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the type of wood that's used, the char that's used, how many times it's been um, put through different cycles, whether it be, you know, bourbon or cognac. Um, now you're having all sorts of things in it. You're having cider, you're having beers, you're having coffee beans aged in bourbon barrel. Mm. I actually heard that and I was like, oh, great, the cost is going to go through the roof for these barrels. And now that Yeesh. Starbucks wants to age coffee beans in there, I was like, <laughs> that sucks. Are so. You- yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, and, and I can't think of the name of the room, but when we were on the tour, the first room we began in, are those the fermenters or the large uh, wood barrel? Uh, oh, so the fooders. The yeah. fooders. The but they're fooders. Like, you're the, this is the first time I've ever seen them be wooden. Like, mm-hmm. How did you come to that decision? Uh, how do you choose the type of wood for that? Or how does that add to the brewing process? Because you had like Italian guys come out and then, like <laughs> you flew Italians out to like build this. Yeah, so... When it gets to just brewing in general, uh, it's a living, you know, constantly changing uh, thing. Mm-hmm. So we're trying to give it an environment to create the taste that we want. We can't really tell it what to do. So we can, you know, we can choose the malts, we can choose the hops, we can design the water, we can run it through different, you know, brewing techniques, and then we can pitch the right yeast and at the right temperature and hopefully give it an environment that gives us an awesome flavor, which we're pretty good and pretty consistent at on the stainless steel tanks that you saw as right. you walk through. Uh, and then the next step, if you want to, you know, take some of that certainty out of it and really cook some different flavors, um, you get into the wood aging. So the wood aging, there's so many parameters or so many different things we could talk through, but it's it's really all it's about is giving this group of organisms an environment you want to cook the taste out that you want. So the fooders are, are really thick. So the thickness, and they're really tall. So the thickness and the tall. and the the height of the tank. Um, helps block the oxygen from entering into the beer. Okay. So that's step one. Step two is, you know, brew a beer, um, pitch in our, our house culture that we've been now putting together over the last seven years that has lactobacillus, pediococcus, all sorts of bretomyces and some funky yeasts. So when we make the beer, we can kind of coax out these different things to grow stronger. So if you want it to be super sour, you make sure when you're brewing the beer, it's not too hoppy because the hops can keep the lactobacillus from growing and it won't be really tart. But if you don't want it to be tart, you, know, you put a little more hop in there. Not so much that it's like an IPA, but enough that it's kind of blocking that lactobacillus from getting sour. If you want it to be, you know, real funky and barnyardy and earthy and armpitty, 
you can design. Um, well, I don't. I don't really like that, so we kind of avoid that one. But um, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> some I people mean, like that stuff. No, I mean, when you talk about like, I mean, there's dankiness and some yeah. like Buzzy said it was like something was like smell like a foot. Like you yeah, know what I mean? Yeah. Like there's a lot of. I mean, but I mean, if you think about food, like cheese is terrible. Totally. Like it's a terrible thing. You you smell that as a baby. You're like, what the fuck is this? And, but then you put it in your mouth. You're like, all right, you know, I can get past it. Like <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, a lot of the things that we eat are not. You know, they're, they're 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 not instinctive, like, <laughs> you know what I mean? but they're not arm pity. I mean, we <laughs> we <laughs> yeast like it's brewed okay. uh, with with yeah, bacteria. Yeah. Like you're, you're putting bacteria, you're introducing bacteria into the thing that you're gonna it's eat. Like eventually. a flu shot. I guess. Yeah. I mean, and it's. They no. offer those free at my job. They say <laughs> they offer those at Giant Eagle. Hey, yo, come get a flu shot. With this loaf of bread, I guess you or you are putting it in there, knowing that eventually it's going to die. So yeah, sure. <laughs> now, so with with those with those feeders, how can you continue to brew? Can you brew different styles of beer with that same one, or is it like is you that can. now committed to? So it's committed to having that group, the group of organisms living in the wood. Like you okay. can never really get it out completely. You can beat it back if you really want to, but we we really don't want to. We wanted to have it, you know, living in the wood and always being there. So whatever beer we put in it has to be designed to coax out certain things to grow. So if we want it to be wild elf, it's great. You put in some cherries that are super tart and sweet. Uh, we have a base beer, mad elf, that um, has the right hop content, alcohol content to kind of control or rein in, let's say, the growth of those little critters. And then we get a really nice tartness or acidity, but not, not crazy funky and not crazy tart. And then you get some of that bretomesis growing that gives, uh, oh, here we go. Oh, so it's like a cast iron skillet. It is. It All cures right, over time. Exactly. For those, for those who can't brew, like myself, <laughs> think of it as a cast iron skillet. They're not, just, they're just not just making your steak in the oven. So when you choose the wood, like, is there is there a wood that just is good with everything? Is there like a chicken of wood? Like that just, yeah, you know I mean, that's just kind of... <laughs> You know, bland and, you know, I mean, it's, it's or, or are you looking for a wood that has a specific flavor that you're all, you know what I mean? Yeah, so, yes and no. But the basic is oak. So if you use oak, but oak has so many different, rend- like, species and so many, they're grown in all over the country, not all over the country, the world. So we, we have favorites that we choose for our small barrels, and those can coax out some really interesting oak flavors. Um, for a beer like Wild Elf, I wasn't really interested in tasting too much of the wood. I really wanted to taste the cherries. So we, we didn't want to confuse it too much. Yeah, there you go. It yeah, gets you here and it gets you right here. Yeah. <laughs> hey, what so, is this? This, this is the wild, uh, wild Elf. Yeah. Yeah. So if you take, uh, so for those fooders, they're four inch thick staves, um, grown in Hungarian, um, French oak, Hungarian oak, and Italian oak. So they're very, very small. Um, uh, fibers, which blocks the air, which is which is great. But the oak itself has has been steamed and not toasted very heavily, so you don't get a lot of oak flavor. You know, you're just you're just getting that environment for those things to grow into. Now we have other other fooders that we've done with heavier toast with different wood, and we have you know tons of American oak, you know Shenandoah, Shenandoah Valley uh, American oak um, small tanks that have been toasted to a medium toast. Then when you put a sour brown into, you can get a really strong toast to coconut flavor out of. So it's all about what flavor do you want. You kind of ask yourself that, and you design the the home for that taste. I just find it amazing that, again, and I've said it a thousand times on this podcast, and I'll say it again. I just find it amazing that you could take something that isn't anything and then turn it into something else. Like, there's no coconut in this, but somehow you're making a coconut flavor. That's crazy to me. That's that's alchemy. That's that, this magic. It's like, wow. Like, you could do that as a party trick. <laughs> I Does mean, this, this, it'd be a very long party trick. Yeah, it's a six month <laughs> six month party trick. <laughs> <laughs> Just stay right there. It's, it's coming. It's coming. Wait for it. <laughs> so this, does this change the way you look at trees now? <laughs> Are you walking through a forest? Now like, I'm looking like, damn, that'd be a hell of a barrel right there. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, that looks nutty as hell. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what, what do we got next up on the, on on the uh, on the list of? This 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 buffet of, so of here we go. brews. I think what we're go to is the Apple Farmhouse because mm. this will switch gears pretty pretty would you, aggressively. Would you, would you call this this Ed? 
So this this is our Apple Farmhouse Ale. This is a scratch beer we brewed. Uh, they're with Winchester and Fuji apples that were grown right down the road. Uh, so we brought them in and we mixed it into basically a Belgian wit base. But the Winchester apples, what's really cool about them is they're intensely tart. So you're going to get this really nice, like, classic apple flavor, but it's it's dry and it's tart and not quite sour, but, uh, you know, really interesting. Yeah, because I, I don't like cider. You know what I mean? Like, I'm not a big cider fan or whatever, but I, I love apples. So, you know, and uh, when they told me that you guys had an apple-like beer, I was like, what? So I'm excited about it. And this is actually, this is perfect because it does have that apple flavor, but it doesn't, like, I don't know how to explain it. It's, it's just, just it refreshing. Yeah, it, but it doesn't have that, like, I guess that super sugariness that no. cider tends to have, like a sweet, you know what I mean? Like, this is a beer with yeah. apple, you know what I mean? We're fermenting incredibly dry with this, so mm-hmm. we don't want any residual sweetness to it. So you pick a yeast that can just, you know, eat the fructose from the apples, and uh, the malic acid that's still in there has a really nice tartness, mm-hmm. and then uh, it dries out. Now, drinking it after the wild elf. Um, the wild elf is way, way more sour. Well, yeah. Uh, so that tempered it a little bit. But if you're going from like a sunshine pills to a apple uh, farmhouse, then you can get that like increase in tartness. Mm. Very yeah, well done. I, yeah, I sipped this and I immediately immediately thought it was sunny outside. Like it's just so. <laughs> it just I don't know. Maybe it's because the the mad elf was was more sour. But this this is like super refreshing. Yeah. Yeah, and then it's part of our scratch beer series too, which gives us a chance to, you know, kind of be fun as brewers and try different ingredients or different brewing techniques to, to, to hopefully kind of learn from. So with the scratch, uh, with, the, with the scratch uh, brews that you do, um, is there like a goal in mind when you do you have like a running list of things that like you're trying? Like, do you have a board with like a bunch of beers? You're like, all right, well, next one, this one didn't work, or, or are you just kind of like freestyling it? Yes. That, I don't know what, what both. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> does it does yeah. it come from travel? Like, have you just traveled and been like, all right, yeah. I've tasted this here. I want to I want to make it kind of like with the double back or double. I don't even know if I'm double bock. Double bock. So in- inspiration <laughs> can really come from any experience we have. Mm. Uh, often it does come from a food experience or a food memory of some kind. And then I have a wall where I'll you know write down an idea for a beer on a sticky note and put it on the wall, and then come back to it later. Um, it's not just me. We have a team of people here that are on the scratch beer team. So Chris is one of them. And then we have, you know, head of production, one of our head of brewing and then uh, head of quality. And we just sit around and talk, sometimes just talk about beer and, and what are we into and what do we want? Um, other times we're actually looking for certain tastes or trying to perfect certain techniques. Like, you know, sometimes it's not that glamorous. It's, Hey, the barley coming in this year is a little different. Let's learn how to brew on it to make sure we're as efficient as possible, and we're you know having a consistent flavor for perpetual IPA. So we'll we'll try different recipes out. Um, those aren't the fun ones, but those are the necessary ones. That's a necessary side of brewing. And then you know the next day I might go to a farmer's market and have some peaches and um, mash them with. Uh, you know, some bourbon and some uh, brown sugar, and all of a sudden we have a recipe idea for freaky peach. So a sour peach beer that's aged in bourbon barrels. So, you know, it really can come from anywhere. How many of your, or how often does a, a, a scratch beer become, say, a seasonal or like, you know, a regular? So last year we did about 100 scratch beer recipes. Wow. Uh, and what, one, mud, two made it into the rotation. So how often that, are you introducing the scratch beer? Like, I'm, I'm, like the recipes. How often are you introducing a new one to actually go into production? It's like every three days. Yeah, like, <laughs> yeah, we're we're brewing them constantly. So once a week, we'll have hopefully at least one, sometimes two scratch beers come out. Uh, it kind of depends on time of year and what we're doing. Is that like your release from the 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 business side, like from the paperwork? It's like your <laughs> release is to go here and just create something. Absolutely, yeah. If I do all of my work, I can reward myself with creating a beer recipe. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> nice. that's a great reward. Until your lady, the lady of your life, did starts writing recipes on your board. You should make asparagus. Like, no, I don't want, I don't want asparagus. Birthday too. cake. <laughs> uh, so what is what are, what are we having now? Smells like perpetual. Yeah, so here's perpetual IPA. Ah, yeah. points. Where is it? Do I get a? He read it off the tray. <laughs> I had this perpetual in front of us for six minutes. <laughs> oh, this is. I mean, it's perpetual. It's like the. It's it's trogues. Uh, so, so it's actually kind of funny you say it that way because for 15 years we we actually 
Dude, we didn't purposely refuse to brew an IPA, but we never really brewed an IPA. Really? You know, yeah. 15 years into it, we were like, ah, we don't need to do an IPA. There's all these other recipes out there we want to try. Um, so we kept just brewing around the IPA. We can, you know, n- the Nugget Nectar was an Imperial Amber Ale because we couldn't bring ourselves to call it an IPA. Like, we just <laughs> never really got around to it. And then we move into our, our new brewery here, and uh, we're able to do a lot more of these scratch beers we just talked about. And This was a scratch beer? Inevitably, yeah, we started rolling uh, yeah. rolling some scratch beers out, and it, we kept, our taste kept going back to the IPA, and we like you know, the hop combinations. We really liked how it was all coming together. Um, created a new way for us to hop through building a, a hop back and just you know dialed it in and we we're like this is awesome this is great and now it's our our lead dog it's our number one. So the scratch beer process is this the original recipe or is this like after several tweaks? It, this is probably seven recipes in. Mm. Now we'll say every time you do a scratch beer, it's not always aiming at anything other than understanding something. If that makes sense. It's, you, know, you might want to understand how a hop tastes in beer one, but in beer seven, you'll use the same hop in a completely different way. Yeah. So um, you're courting the beer. That's yeah. pretty much you're courting it. Like, I ain't really trying to understand you. I just want to understand something. <laughs> like, I get it. Like how you work and then just put <laughs> exactly. you in this environment that's how you, that's and how you see how it, it yeah. Um, this was also the first beer that we came out with once we, we moved the brewery from, from Harrisburg to Hershey. Oh. So we had, and not that that's really relevant, more from a capacity standpoint. Like, we never really had the extra tanks. We, we had kind of hit our cap at the original brewery. And then once we were here, we felt like we could kind of open up the, open up the doors a little bit. And this was the first, you know, year-round beer that we launched once we had this up and running. Nice. So where did, where, why is it called Perpetual? Like, are these names? We, we rarely ask these name questions. Why do they call it Perpetual? Yeah, well, we'd like to think that all of our names kind of have some type of meaning or mm-hmm. reference to either the beer or the process, or maybe it's just John or I. Um, the perpetual name really is kind of symbolic of how we felt the brewery has been, and that's we feel like we've been in perpetual motion or always under construction. Well, Troganators. College nickname. <laughs> <laughs> was, that, was that really a college was, nickname? Whose nickname was that? I don't know. <laughs> it sounds like it could be, though, right? Okay. No, because it, 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 like, it has a very 90s, like, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger. It's like, like the Shermanator. Right. Right? Yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Everything was a nader. Like, if you were badass, you were a nader. Like, I was a day in nader back in 95. Yeah. Like, no, no, <laughs> no, it's, it's not really... true at all. <laughs> <laughs> it, can I live? <laughs> can I write my own tale? <laughs> That does sound pretty good, but no, it was really the Troganator is more of a playoff of our brewery name, and uh, historically a lot of uh, traditional German breweries would name a double bock, it would end in A-T-O-R. So it was really kind of following that path, but it was our, you know, it was based on the Trog's name. Yeah, gotcha, gotcha. That's not as fun to say, but yeah. <laughs> I just pictured y'all like, you know, pull, like ripping your shirt off at a frat party. Troganator, troke, troke, troke. Like, <laughs> I, I bet it's been done before, but probably not by John. <laughs> oh, who let the Troganator in? Like, it just wild. Like, <laughs> You know the Troganator's been here. You know, all right, so. Uh, per- <laughs> nah, I was just going to let you keep going. I just, I just want to see how many different variations of this you was going to get to. So, <laughs> all right, so what's, what's the next we got on, on deck? We got this Nimble Giant. I think we're going to roll right into oh, Nimble, Nimble Giant. Gi- I haven't had the Nimble Giant yet. Oh, get him too. I haven't had the Nimble Giant yet. This is a, this is a first for me. So while we're, while we're brewing through scratch beers and whether we're searching for recipes or techniques or learning ingredients, mm, every once in a while, funky. you know, we're, we're tossing a beer in for, for us. Um, so as a group of brewers, whenever we're like kind of scratching our heads, well, what are we going to do now? We're like, ah, oh, just do a double IPA. And then as we were doing that, we kept playing around with the hops and playing around with the malt. And then we started to see this beer develop into something really special. And it became our favorite. And as it was our favorite, we started hearing a lot of people in the tasting room, especially being like, holy crap, this is really good. This is really good. Like, you got to bring this back. What? So then, you know, then it it just kind of was born from that. So we weren't searching for, I mean, who needs another double IPA in this world? Mm. Like, there's so many freaking double IPAs. We were like, this is just too good. Um, I don't remember how the name came about. Was it you? Well, it's all been about balance, too. I mean, it's a really, really big beer. It's super hoppy, super malty, higher in alcohol, but it doesn't, there's not one particular thing that really overpowers. 
and it's a really nice balance. So it's a giant beer, and we've always kind of felt like we need to be nimble too. You know, like we've been changing and bobbing and weaving for some time. So it's you know, it really, I think it's the perfect name for the perfect beer. It's like a well, you, your your naming process is so well thought out. There's nothing, yeah. there's nothing ratchet about it at all. It's like, yeah, this is a big beer. It's kind of nimble. Da, da, da. Like, come on, man. Where's the weird story? <laughs> well, did, did we, I mean, we do go through millions of, of <laughs> reiterations of. The oh, name. this wasn't the original the, name. Okay. Well, no, no it, it, it's not. Actually, that one did come pretty fast though. When I was driving down the road, but that was after months of trying to come up with the name. But you know, it, it, it it's funny here. It's a very collaborative effort. I think a lot of people. Sometimes late night after hours or on weekends, you know, we're texting each other about an idea or of a beer or a beer name and 99% of them get shot down, but it's still, it's, you know, it seems like it's, it, it's a constant conversation it's that we're like, having. Oh, it has this <laughs> dank, like it definitely has a funky dank, like kind of, yeah. what, uh, what, did, what did Buzzy say? Like a foot. Was, well, yeah, I mean, it's, <laughs> but it's. I don't smell foot fungus. <laughs> oh, at this point, in the, in your the foot must smell really good. Day is just going to start naming hops that he knows. Right, yeah, that's what I'm just I'm <laughs> just buckshot approach. <laughs> Galaxy, no, <laughs> gotta shoot your shot. <laughs> gotta shoot your shot. We did uh, want a, a balance of that kind of. I hate saying the word dank, but it is. It's kind of that dankiness. There's a little bit of that citrus and a little bit of that pineapple going on. Yeah, it has. Yeah. Um, yeah, you said nimble, like it kind of bounce, like it bounces around through kind of bounce, that exactly on and your palate. You, get, you had to be nine percent because otherwise it, it, does, it, it would just kill you. Like is, it would well, be too deceptive hoppy. Deceptive nine percent. Yeah, well, I don't know if it's deceptive because we've had so many, but like I mean, it is. It does. It feels deceptive. Like it doesn't have. Like you know, well, on the back end, once you swallow and then breathe out, you're like, mm, there might be a little there, you know. But like taking it in, like it doesn't have that heavy. You know, <laughs> well, sit back I, in and taking it in. Yeah. I know, and I think I think the burping is is an important process of tasting. Do you, do you, is the belch important I, to I, you? I I genuinely Absolutely. believe. I was I was talking about fiance the other day, and like you know, I burped in a restaurant, and like you know, she was like, "Don't do that in here." She, I was like, "But it's a restaurant." She's like, "Nobody else is burping," and I was like, "Why? This is the one place you should be able to burp. This is the place where you're digesting the most food. Like I just I'm digesting food and beer. I should be able to burp here. Why not? If it's not here, then anywhere. It's like you go to the bathroom." I should be able to fart here. Why do I always feel awkward when I fart in a stall next to a dude? Like, I, well, like, you I, should feel awkward I should about be, any release of bodily I, I, function no, while we in a natural. stall. Like, I'm handling my. This is it's a private. No. This is a private moment it's that's kind of made public because they don't have those dividers anymore. I don't want your gas seeping into. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's a, but I don't want. I don't want to ingest your <laughs> fart. Like, I'm. Uh, it's come gonna on, happen. I've got to go back you, to dinner. Whether you hear it or not, I think it's more. I think it's more uh, uh, courteous. To to actually have a sounding one, so at least I know what I'm getting into. Yeah, you know I mean, no. it's not creeping up on me while I'm like, a bro, you no, really I don't you know, know what I'm getting I have into. Have the choice if to maybe I'm use- using the urinal and then I hear a fart. <laughs> That's not what I came here for. <laughs> it's like it's now it's in the fabric of my shirt. Like it's weird. <laughs> But it doesn't, it's going to be there whether you know what I, I but again I think that this restaurants is why you have to cut day off after I was going to say that was half a nimble giant <laughs> I just, I just that's wanna, all that was I half wanna, a nimble giant I, I want to change the norms and I think you should be able to fart and burp in restaurants and bathrooms that's just it that should be where you should you should do but it but not here at Trobes don't, not, don't fart in the bathroom <laughs> yeah, but, but I, yeah the nimble giant there's a little he's difference he's a beanstalk giant like it's weird Chris will literally try beers and then text me if his burps are good or not. Like, is this, this, is this is real? This, yeah, and, and and I would not do that with a fart. <laughs> <laughs> so the snack bar, they on their own as far as <laughs> they don't know what they're giving out. They don't know if it's good or not because he's not texting you about his farts. But y'all know about the beer, okay? <laughs> Yeah, y'all ain't that close. I know y'all brothers, but y'all ain't y'all ain't that close. Oh, uh, so what's the what's next up <laughs> so on the list? We kind of did this totally backwards. Uh, usually, this is what you'd start with. Um, so this is Sunshine Pills. Okay. Uh, we have a night, really nice uh, base Pilsner malt. Um, we want to not muck it up then, so we, we're gentle with the hops. We use some really nice German hops, and then a lager yeast that. Gives it a really nice, uh, I say nice 10,000 times that time, but so it'll be crisp, it's refreshing, um, but it's, it's very delicate, so there's nowhere to hide. It's one of the hardest beers we have to brew. So as you're brewing it, you have to pay attention to everything from raw ingredients in to your water, 
you can't burn it while you're cooking the mash. You can't boil it too hard. Like it yeah. tastes very like like it tastes very like pure. Like, like yeah. when we had like some of that like uh, barley or whatever. Like yep. it tastes like that, just in yeah, glass so, form. Only. So as you're as you're eating the barley, like that is what we want to bring through. So yeah. we pick amazing barley. It has incredibly complexity, but it is super subtle. So you just, you just can't get in the way of that. And that's what we do uh, all the way through. We, you want to balance out the sweetness of barley with a little bit of hop. And then that, ye- that yeast, that, uh, so, so delicate and um, just plays really well together. This, I had, we had it during the tour and we had it with, uh, from the fermenter. So this is a nice, nice like, you know, difference or whatever. Um, getting the, the finished products. Is, yeah, I mean, the color on this is amazing. This is a sexy beer. Yeah, no, it looked like a champagne almost. It, like, it this does, is, like this though. is yeah, you put this in I the right glass. I gotta have my pinky out. You can stunt. Right. Yeah, I gotta have my pinky out. I gotta yeah. have a blazer with a shirt with the top button undone. Yeah. Like <laughs> this is rap video beer. Like yeah. I can pour this. <laughs> like yeah, no, I'm, yeah, not, I'm just, living. <laughs> not just pouring this beer on, on some woman's back in a music video. No, <laughs> but if we did, we could sell records. Which is what I'm saying. <laughs> I mean, you know, maybe we could sell some more podcasts. Maybe, you know. Well, speaking um, of pouring beer, now we did. We did. During the tour, we touched. We we stopped at the art gallery upstairs, and we wanted to to, to speak on that because they oh, had yeah. the one the one picture where I don't were they pouring beer on mountains or something. Yeah, like, it was like it know. was like a it was a, like a mountain of labels, and then it was like an ocean of like beer. Like you know what I mean? Yeah, like who who where did the idea for the the art gallery contest to come come from? Especially, I think it's I think it's smart. Like they have to use trog labels. Um, in the art, and so you get like this vast variety of submissions. But definitely. one, they always have trogues in there, and also definitely saw some dope. trogue shades. I'd rock like I saw some trogue Nikes. Yeah, you know? <laughs> <laughs> like, give me a the good pair of Levi's. I'd rock those. It yeah, that, it definitely has evolved. I think over time, we've been running that art of trogues contest now for about about ten years, and there's really not a whole lot of parameters. Like we we're just kind of curious to see what people can create with. Uh, Using our logo could be packaging, could be could be a digital image. It's just kind of their own interpretation of what they want to what they want to create. I think you know, as brewers, we feel the same way when we're making beer, mm-hmm. and it's kind of nice to see uh, you know what people can do with our artwork. So, how how did that come to be? Like, were were you all? Your background was it in art, or was it something that was suggested to no, you, or I, was I mean, it that, like, hey, that, we can get someone to use our label? That sounds a lot cooler. I think it, I think yeah. it, it, it extended. I kind of have a bad habit at home when I open a bottle of beer. I put the cap in the drawer right above it. And over time, that drawer fills up. And I used to get the question from my wife all the time, like, what, what, what are we going to do with all these caps? And then, you know, that kind of extended to, to maybe trying to create some kind of artwork with bottle caps. So originally it was bottle cap art. And then we felt from there, look, it doesn't have to be limited to bottle caps. It could be really any, any type of packaging or, or piece of trogues art that they want to use. Hmm. It is dope. I mean, I really like the, uh, I guess, like the salvage art. I don't know the, the name of it, but like that whole vein of art that like takes, I guess, like junk and makes it into something beautiful. I mean, something that would be in a landfill otherwise and then makes it something that people will hang on their wall. Like, I mean, that's that's an amazing form, you know, to take junk and turn it into beauty. Same thing like you guys do. You just like pick wild fucking barley and shit and, and then put it in a glass and it's like it's delicious. I mean, I'd enjoy it better in a glass than if I just picked it wild and just threw it in my mouth. I Take mean, junk and make beer. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think it's barley. Nobody's like, oh, man. Like, nobody's out here, like, you know, with a handful of barley. Like, yeah, you know, just popping it. Like, you know what I mean? It's kind of... Indigenous people probably used to do it. They, they probably did. I mean, they didn't live the lives like us. I mean, the quality of living was a little lower back then. You know what I mean? Like, that was a luxury, you know. Yeah, that's true. We got satellites now. You got to up your game. <laughs> so, so the bottle cap drawer... Uh, do you suggest that for dudes, or do you think we shouldn't do this? Does that get you in trouble at home? Like, I feel like if I had a bottle cap drawer, I'd just have to answer a lot of questions. I still have a lot of bottle caps in my drawer. Well, yeah, you, you and you he's also, still married. So. He's, yeah, well, you also have a brewery that you own. Like, I don't have that. Like, <laughs> my bottle cap drawer, that's just all money that went out of our lives <laughs> into my We, we got to make this podcast pop so that you can have your own little bottle cap drawer. <laughs> that's the goal. The end goal is so that Ed can have a bottle cap drawer. It's, it's all work related. So whenever we go to a restaurant and want to try beer, you know, it's, it's for work. If we go to a brewery, that's for work. It's like a I mean, tax write off. Yeah, you yeah, yeah, exactly. can see what's going on. Out in the world, should have thought about that. Bottle cap drawer—that's all part of work. 
<laughs> so the the hazy IPA craze, like, how do you guys feel about that? Are you buying into it? Or are you guys trying to, like, avoid that? Like, you've avoided IPAs in general? Like, what's that? Because, I mean, it's, like, everywhere now. Well, yeah, I'm, I am really curious to know what you guys think the hazy IPA craze is. Like, um, I mean, it's, it's, it's highly drinkable. Yeah. Um, I guess if you were going to introduce somebody to an IPA, you probably go with a, you know I mean, like more of a juicy, citrusy kind of a, as opposed to like a straight, like, uh, uh, who's it, like a uh, big hop, you know? Um, yeah, so we've, you know, when we tackle uh, beers in general, we, we never start with a style. So we never say, hey, we want to brew a really good, whatever, uh, Black Pilsner. Doesn't matter. That's one of the jokes of the brewery. Is it uh, Black Pilsner? No. Oh, was- one of our- <laughs> One of our old brewers used to want to brew one, so um, that's totally separate. So we never start with a style name. We always just think of, you know, can we drink the beer in our head and what would that taste like? You know, the color be, will the alcohol be, uh, yeast maybe, hops, whatever, all the ingredients in your, in, all together to create this beer that would be delicious. And then after we brew it, we like, oh, we need to describe this. Like, what style is it? And then we have to kind of put it into a category, kind of. But sometimes we make our own, so... Imperial Amber Ale didn't exist until Nugget Nectar was called an Imperial Amber Ale. Yeah, um, dust your shoulders off. So. You got when you say that, you gotta you gotta brush your shoulder off. I'm not saying we were the yeah. only one. It was a humble brag. I was gonna just let it go. I'm not sure we were the only ones doing it, but it wasn't really a, a style at the time. So we never say never, other than a smoked beer. Like I, I really can't stand smoked beer, so I probably never will do a smoked beer. But other than that, you know, when we do a hundred recipes a year, yeah, who knows? That's we're not avoiding it. We're just there's so many things that yeah. we want to do. Like yeah. we might. It's yeah. like ah, you know, why even chase? Why well, chase when you can create? Won't be a New England IPA because we're not in New England. So it'll be a Central Pennsylvania IPA, mm. but like that's totally different. That's how I think about everything in life. Like this isn't a you know this isn't a T-shirt. This is a day T-shirt. This yeah. is mine. Totally. Yeah, very much because ain't nobody wearing this like me. No, ain't nobody <laughs> else gonna wear that. <laughs> 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 what's our, what's our, Nobody else is aware. This is our last uh, tasting before we get out of here. So, Crimson Pistol. This was this was a fun one. So, we uh, fun I actually uh, went to a Crimson Pistol. Crimson Pistol. Yeah, that's the it's name. A red. It's a, it's a red pistol. Sure. All right. Explain that. Uh, <laughs> the beer looks like beer wise. Origin story. You know, I went to a homebrew meeting and a homebrewer had a really delicious hibiscus sour. I loved it, and I brought the concept back to our our scratch beer team, and I was like, "We got to do." I really had this great Ooh. hibiscus sour. The hibiscus adds this really nice tartness to the beer, and an amazing color. And they're like, "Yeah, that sounds great, but no, let's do an IPA." So they totally took what you know the first concept and rolled it into the um, you know the hops that we're using play very well with the tartness of the hibiscus. So we make a hibiscus tea and kind of blend it with the beer, and that's that's what you're gonna have here. Wow. Yeah, I didn't even know hibiscus was a, a plant until shortly ago. So the fact that I'm drinking this is amazing. I've only drunk hibiscus. I've never seen it I, as yeah, a I've plant. Seen. I've never seen it in plant form. It's always just been beer to me. So <laughs> I, I don't know if it's a plant or not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Are there some growing around here? Where do you get your hibiscus? You got a guy for that, too? Yeah, we got a guy for yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> he, he, he dries it and then sends it to us. Yeah. 1-800-Flowers is like, oh, and that's, a, that's a twofer. You get your girl some flowers, and then you just crunch them bitches up and throw them make a beer. I don't know. Are they romantic type flowers? Can you get your girl? Can I get my girl some flowers? Because some hibiscus. Would she enjoy those? Or uh, you know, I've only seen them dry, so I don't think like, we've never actually had. A- mm, we need to figure that out. Any women? It, do you get? Do you guys enjoy a nice? Hib- I shouldn't be talking to you guys. I've been. This is the fourth. I'm breaking the fourth wall. For anybody listening at home, there's actually people in this room. <laughs> if you haven't heard their laughter in the background, so I broke the fourth wall. This is actually amazing. Um, no, it's a little dry. Uh, we wanted to make sure the tartness of the hibiscus came through uh, and then you know wanted to lift it with a little bit of the, the hop to accentuate it and not make it too sweet because a lot of hibiscus tea like we didn't want to connect it to a sweet hibiscus tea we wanted to make sure you have that integrity of the of the flower in general mm. or overall I, I like that the the hop forward you know like same, th- same thing with the uh, you know like pilsners and lagers and like everything that you guys like like you have that for me just a uh, flavor wise I guess uh, I just enjoy that a lot so like I can't drink a, a regular pilsner or lager like a you know your Miller lights and Budweiser or whatever like you know I, I typically don't enjoy it because it, they 
tastes like water. But you know, to have that little bit of something there to let you know, like I mean, you're drinking like is that body? I guess is is the yeah. I mean, for all the beers, you're really searching for its own identity and its own you know personality. Mm. So it could be. As today, you've seen all sorts of colors, all sorts of ingredients and intensities and tartness and bitterness and maltiness. It's it's kind of all over the board. Yeah, this has been a circus. I don't know, I don't know if you yeah, guys... Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm really... This is... If you guys are listening at home, like, check out the pictures, uh, check out the video. I mean, if you, you could... This, this is actually going to be uh, recorded on video. I don't know if you guys are listening to this in your car right now, um, but there's you can actually hop on YouTube. You can watch this whole thing. Um, but, I mean, this is a smorgasbord, and it looks like a circus of beers, and it's like beautiful rainbow um, of flavors and... Um, we're excited that we got this chance to come down here and enjoy all these, especially fresh. I've never had trogues from – this is the, tr- the freshest, like, trogues I've ever straight had. Straight off the boat. Yeah, straight off the boat. This, like, this is crazy. Like, this, I'm, I'm very, very honored to actually have had been able to sit here and, and taste these. And I don't know what a smorgasbord is, but they said it twice today, so that's what's up. Charlotte's Web, man. <laughs> <laughs> it's, just, it's Charlotte's Web. I'm just Web. saying, I don't know if it appeared twice in that book, though, but <laughs> – <laughs> find another word is all I'm saying. <laughs> you just gotta find another word. But no, these are all really, like. Are you are, are either of you like chefs by nature? Like, do you cook at home or like especially listening to your explanations of the beers? Like, I couldn't even fathom. Like, all right, I want this type of flavor. I want this to happen. I want the hop to bring it up. I couldn't even imagine having the for, foresight to even create something like that. Like, how do you? I definitely wouldn't say chef, but I would say we. We love taste, and we love taste experience. So taste memory, taste experience. So we, we just like ingredients, and we like to see how we can you know, kind of coax them into really cool things, whether it be food or, or beer. So yeah, He's down, downplaying it just a little bit. If, if we're not texting each other about beer names, we're, we're texting photos of food we're cooking. <laughs> so I, I got two questions. Uh, first question uh, well, three questions actually. Before we wrap this up, uh, first, how uh, how pivotal is texture in beer? Uh, because texture is, is huge. I mean, like in, in in food in general. And I don't think a lot of people understand that in beer. There are b- beers that are lighter. Some have more like you know mouth feel and all that. Like, how important is that in beer? Yeah, I think texture is kind of the unsung hero. Like, you have to have amazing texture that will either play up or play down certain flavors and. Texture doesn't affect aroma, but if aroma can, to me, affect texture. So the viscosity, the in- intensity of taste, the bitterness, the sourness, the saltiness, even in a goza, incredibly important. What is your favorite forms of potato? What? <laughs> the French fry potato, maybe? French fry? <laughs> yeah, uh, skillet, I cube it, skillet, put egg on top. Yeah, I mean, because a potato, I mean, all it is is the texture. It's the potato and the flavor. I mean, you can make a potato taste like anything, like in, with any form, but it's a texture thing, you know? Uh, like a skillet potato is, you know, fried as the crispy edges. It got the soft middle, like, you know, uh, French fries, like crispy on the outside. It's fried. It got that little flavor in there. It's soft, you know? Um, <laughs> nah, that's a texture man. thing. What? It's, <laughs> it's all. <laughs> where did that go? Potatoes are all a texture thing. It's we all have a- potatoes coming out next, y'all. We have sunshine potatoes. <laughs> <laughs> Y'all just don't know about it. Trail's going to have their own potato line. And then the they la- got a guy <laughs> in Idaho. And then the last question. It's a, it's a, before we go that far, it's actually funny. Yesterday, I was meeting with a local farm that was planting potatoes for us because the terrar they have will take make take the potato and make it taste slightly different. A tohu? So, yeah. I'm, yeah, he said that as if we knew what that meant. <laughs> <laughs> he slid that in as if we were like, oh, yeah, tarar, yeah. So, that sound like an expensive dessert. No, it was just funny how, you know, something as <laughs> plain Jane as a potato, depending on how it's grown and where it's grown, actually does have a pretty significant difference in taste. Not only in taste, it can have a difference in color as well. So, something as, you know, as plain Jane as that, depending on where it's grown, tastes totally different. So, it's, it's, Ingredients are pretty amazing if you if you if you look for them. Yeah, I didn't know that. I guess whatever you grow it by it might take on or yep. soil and all that. You know what I mean? Soil, yeah. yeah. Um, so what does BBL stand for on the side of all these tanks? Brewers Barrel. Brewers oh, Barrel. Oh, there okay. it is. Brewers Barrel. We've been Brewers at, Barrel. We asked uh, several brewers, and they were like, "It just means it just barrel." Means and we're barrel. like, 
But what does the B B L say? Yeah, it's, so Brewers Barrels. I they always uh, get Brewers Barrels. They don't get regular people barrels. Yeah, well, they don't. <laughs> are they? Yeah, are there regular people's barrels? Like, well, he used to roll them down the street to sell them to places. <laughs> Vagabond barrels, like <laughs> buy this beer so I could get an extra B in this, in this abbreviation. <laughs> Try to <laughs> work up to the BB. <laughs> I didn't know that. Thank you. Yeah, so Brewer's Barrel's 31 gallons. Distiller's Barrel that we would buy would be 55 gallons. Sometimes. Distiller's Barrel. So it's like DDLs. A, so I don't know if they call it DDL, but if you look here, uh, these different these different barrels all yeah. around us, you know, this will be 55 gallons, and that might be 61 gallons. So depending Where on how... Where do they come up with these, like, 55 and a 61? That's an odd number. So it's a distillery barrel. So this is just a... This is what... Wine and and all the you know they use and then you guys use a di- why is it different systems? Uh, that I don't know exactly why. I do know like so the distillers barrels are made with staves that are thinner because it allows the air to pass through and breathe more mm. and faster. The wine barrels generally have thicker staves, so it it has a little bit of oxygen ingress but not too much. And then if that's when you go all the way to the fooder or in between, you can get punchins you can get different size barrels you can get 100 gallons 200 gallons all the way up to you know the 300 barrel tanks that you saw earlier so what type of barrels was donkey kong throwing? <laughs> root beer barrels root know. beer <laughs> barrels all right donkey kong was not wasting brew that's good i was gonna be mad at him for a bit <laughs> now man this has been wonderful like yeah. we, i've had a, a great time of drinking great beer uh, we have to ask, uh, for those who are listening and do not know where they can find you, tell them where they can find you all. Well, we're, we're mostly on the East Coast, mid-Atlantic focused with uh, anywhere from Massachusetts down the whole way to North Carolina. And where can they find you online? Trogues.com. Trogues.com. And we're in Hershey, PA. Yeah. We are? Okay. Yeah, right. I thought yeah, I was yeah. wrong. The way you looked at me, I thought I was wrong. I was like, no, I, I, I had swear the, I, I had saw guess. I, I had to I, I, I was like, I'm not even 100%, but nobody <laughs> corrected us. So, like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we're at Hershey. Um, yeah, stop by, man. Like, come come, stop by, get some great food, great beer, man, at Hershey PA. Yeah. You guys any any events coming up? We do tonight. We're celebrating the uh, Art of Trogues contest here at the brewery and uh, Sneak Peek of Wild Elf that's coming out shortly. Oh, I'm so sorry you guys weren't here for that, but it was amazing, I guarantee you. We haven't done it yet, but I guarantee you it was amazing. Way to make the listeners it. mad, Dave. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, if they want to if they want to enjoy a little bit of it, then uh, check them out online, find out some more events going on. Uh, you guys are on uh, Twitters and the and the IGs and all the kids. Yeah, things. we're all over the internet. Yeah. If you if you Google they Trogues, got a, they got a team for that. Yeah, yeah they, <laughs> they got <laughs> scratch beer teams <laughs> like Seal Team Six. They come in, swoop in with the recipes and all that. They got a team for everything. <laughs> They're Googleable. They're Googleable. Yeah. All right, Dave, let the people know where they can find us. Uh, we are Drinking Partners. If you're looking for us, you can find us on epicastnetwork.com slash partnerspod. You can find us on iTunes, Stitcher, Lipson, and Google Play under Drinking Partners. And you can find us on IG, Twitter, and Facebook at Partnerspod. Hey, uh, we want to thank Chris and John Trogner for having us out here, man. They had a wonderful time. Great hey. tour, great beer. Uh, looking forward to uh, this, this listening release party at a Wild Elf. As you can see, there's uh, there are other people who decide to clap <laughs> while I was trying to close it out. But thank you guys, man. You guys, you guys are awesome. Everything yep. you do, man, yeah. is like really cool. We appreciate like, just, this. Has actually been an amazing like experience. The whole, I mean, it's yeah, yeah. I feel not like even, I got a ticket to Charlie Chocolate Factory. Like yeah, well, the, yeah. Ticket. It's Christmas for day. Like it's just <laughs> he he hasn't stopped smiling since he got here. But I think uh, one thing outside of just the beer, just watching the employees, watching how proud they are to be members yeah. of this organization. It was very refreshing for me. Like, it's really good to see, uh, and we appreciate employers like yourselves. So, uh, thank you all. Uh, thank you all for listening to the podcast. As always, Drinking Partners is the crew, Epicast is the family, and we out of here.
What's the focus, Baron? Focus is the lens, ready?